I recently finished reading the Nameless Cults book, which is a book all about the cults in the Conan universe, and is intended for people running tabletop games in Conan's setting. But it's also great for people like me who just want to read about it for lore reasons. While reading it, I was able to extract information about the most interesting necromancy cults in Conan. Ajujo is a minor god worshipped by the people of Tombalku. During the time that Conan is alive, the new king Sukumba is reviving the worship of Ajujo with the help of his witchman Askia. They've been at work converting the people from the worship of Jill to worshipping Ajujo, and have done so by humiliating the priests of Jill with Askia's sorcery, bestowed upon him by Ajujo. Ajujo is also called the Dark One and he's a god of magic who grants his priests sorcerous powers, most notably curses, alchemy, and necromancy. The exact form and details of the necromancy is unfortunately not elaborated on, so it's up to your interpretation what this may mean. Because I am free to interpret it how I want, I interpret it to mean armies of undead. This makes Ajujo one of the best gods for necromancers in Conan, and Ajujo is also one of the few gods whose benefits explicitly state necromancy rather than just implying it vaguely. The cult of Alchminon has an oracle who people travel far to see and hear its words. The religion is strange and may be a front for other gods. The only mention of necromancy is about witch ghost familiars. The cultists of Alchminon are able to do a ritual that binds a ghost to haunt the cultist. It seems to only work on murdered children so it's quite an evil act indeed. The haunting is beneficial, granting assistance and additional power to sorcery, but there's a catch. The cultist keeps part of the ghost corpse as a kind of ransom to blackmail it into service. Should the sorcerer ever lose that body part, the haunting will become detrimental and the wish ghost familiar will seek to disrupt and hinder the sorcery of its former master. The cult of Alchminon is one of the weaker choices for necromancy, Unlike a Jujo, where the necromancy is explicitly stated, for the cult of Alchminon it does not, but the witch ghost familiar is mentioned. Durketa, also known as Durketo in Stygia, is the goddess of death in some cultures and is worshipped throughout Kush, the Black Kingdoms, Shem, Zimbabwe, and even in Stygia. Each region has a different idea about what she is and what she stands for. In Kush, it is believed that incorrect burials will cause Deketa to send ghosts of those incorrectly buried back to haunt the Kushites. In Zimbabwe, she is believed to be the wife of Dagon, and is depicted as a mermaid. She is associated with fishermen, and her good fortune should result in large catches of fish. In Stygia, she is a goddess of harlots, and in Shem, she is a goddess of fertility. Evil sorcerers are said to be able to use Deketa in creation of witch ghosts. An evil sorcerer who murders his own family, but retains their ears, will then be able to whisper commands into the ear to control the ghost. This small thing about the witch ghost is the only mention of any necromancy. I personally think that she's a weak choice for necromancers, especially since some regions do not associate her with death at all. The cult of Kosatro Kel is a cult that worships a powerful demigod-like entity called Kel. He walked the earth before the Cataclysm, back when the Atlanteans had their mighty civilization, before they devolved back into apes, and then re-emerged as the Sumerians. Kel is an outer dark creature. It is unknown whether he was summoned by sorcerers and broke free, or if he came of his own accord. As an alien creature, he found his form incompatible with this new world, and adopted a man-like shape. He found flesh restrictive, and unable to contain him. So he experimented and discovered that an iron body was suitable. And so this metal man walked the earth, gaining followers and conquering wherever he went. He was defeated by a sorcerer who conspired with other void creatures that hated Kel. They gave him the knowledge to bind Kel, and Kel was defeated and imprisoned, sealed away under the earth where he languished in torment for millennia. But then the cataclysm happened. The cataclysm shattered the world and broke the seal. Kel was free once more. He sought to escape the earth and return back to the void. He gathered the people of Bori under his control. The Bori would later become the Hyborian people of Aquilonia during Conan's time. 
He is then beset upon by the descendants of the Lemurian and Mu people. It is during this time that he is described as using necromancy to defend himself, but that it failed him. There are clearly limits to his necromancy because it is said that he could not find a magical means to keep his Bori followers alive. He gave up on man and involved himself with the people of Dagon. That didn't work out for him because he was defeated and bound again. The cultists of Kasatral Kel are described by the book to be practicing necromancers who search for Kel's prison to free him. The scope of their necromantic power is not elaborated on, so once again, it's up to your interpretation. I like to imagine that they're capable of raising the dead as warriors and using them to make undead armies to fight with. Perhaps one day Kel will be free again, and the metal man and his cultists will stalk the world once more and raise armies of the dead to crush the living. Of all the necromancy gods in Conan, Kel is definitely one of the coolest. Akura is known as the Great Skull, and it is all that remains of one of the most powerful and dangerous sorcerers to ever walk the earth. In life, Nakura was an Atlantean, the ancient ancestors of the Sumerians, who believed that the universe was kept in harmony by a balance between the forces of life and death. Nakura thought differently though, and believed death to be the stronger of the two, and he created his own cult devoted entirely to the death aspect and nothing else. Under the command of Nakura, his followers would round people up and routinely sacrifice them to worship death itself. Then. All of a sudden, he unexpectedly died, but his followers kept his skull and have worshipped it ever since. It is said that his sorceress powers are imbued within the skull itself, for it glows when a sacrifice is made near it. There is no mention of necromancy practiced by the cultists of Nakura, but you could make a good case for it. Set is the snake god of Stygia and is possibly the most known god in Conan, thanks to the Conan the Barbarian movie where Set is prominently featured. I bring Set up because he's often associated with dark sorcery and occasionally with necromancy, however I have found absolutely nothing to suggest that necromancy is a power that the causes of Set are able to use. Snake summoning is a thing, but there's no mention of necromancy at all, not even a vague mention. So I think that Set is not a good choice for necromancers. If you know something I don't, please let me know in the comments. You might be able to argue that because Set is a source of dark magic, maybe necromancy comes in through that angle. The Black God is another being of the Outer Dark and he is worshipped in the Black Kingdoms. The Black God is said to be older than all the other gods. He is perhaps less of a god and more of a force of nature. He does not care about your worship, but when you inflict pain, whether in his name or not, he will be sustained by this awful energy. He is also sustained by human excitement, anger, madness and euphoria, and all of these things, as they are experienced by living humans, are like food to him. Even if he had no worshippers and nobody even knew who he is, it would not matter, and he would be sustained by these things all the same. There is no mention of necromancy with the black god at all, but he is a source of dark magic for dark sorcerers to make use of. It is conceivable that among the dark sorceries offered by the black god, that necromancy would be among them. Thugra Katan was the ruler of an ancient nation, or city, called Kufkumez. He was a king and also a high priest of Set. At some point his interest in Set waned, and he set out on a quest for immortality. This quest led him down dark and sorcerous paths. In his quest, much harm came to his people. The homes of the wise were looted for law. Men, women and children were slaughtered for their blood. When the northern barbarians swept across the nation, he was indifferent. He was completely absorbed in his studies. By the time the barbarians had surrounded his palace and begun to butcher his priests, he didn't care because his elixir was finished. He sealed himself within his chamber and drank the elixir. From then on, he became a myth. 3,000 years after he drank the elixir, he awoke to a new world with different people and nations to what he knew. He restyled himself as Nathok the Veiled One and set out immediately to subjugate the weak with his sorcery and carve out a new dominion. He would eventually be defeated by barbarians again though. As is often the case in Howard's works, Barbarism ultimately triumphs over civilization. While he was around, 
Thugra Katan's sorceress might was formidable. He was able to project himself into people's dreams, and it is also explicitly mentioned that he is able to summon the Shades of the Dead to serve him. More detail on these Shades is not provided, so once again it is up to your interpretation what they might be. His cultists are described as being pretty pathetic, but all of them seek the return of Thugra Katan and immortality. It is conceivable that some of them are somehow able to get their hands on necromancy, because Thugra Katan himself was capable of it, but it's also kind of a stretch. Nevertheless, there's still this small potential for necromancy here. It is well known that Lovecraft and Howard knew each other in real life and shared ideas. Somewhat controversially to some, the world of Kran appears to be within the same universe as Lovecraft's stories. The book attests to this, saying that, for all intents and purposes, Howard treated Lovecraft's universe as writ, placing his Hyborian age wholly within it. As such, many Lovecraftian entities also exist in Conan's world. Azazoth exists as a source of magic for sorcerers to draw upon, as do Lyal Afatep and Yog Sothoth. Conceivably, any of these gods could be used to fuel necromancy with. In Conan Exiles, the Dafari who worship Yog Sothoth are practicing necromancy. I personally don't think that the Lovecrafting gods are the best choice for justifying necromancy with, but it is conceivable. My own theory regarding it all is that Conan's world is set in the prehistory. Lovecraft's world is set kind of like in the middle times, like the modern era. And Zofik is set in the far future, and all of these authors' works are in exactly the same world. My reasoning for this is because of what the books already said and also because of the shared gods among these worlds. In Zavik, it's a harder conclusion to draw because there are less mentions of Lovecraft stuff, but there is the star called Zoth, which is meant to be the same star as in Lovecraft stories, but it's got a slightly different spelling with Z instead of X as the letter in Zoth. So there you have it, the best necromancy gods in the Hyborian Age. Generally speaking, the smaller and lesser known gods are far better candidates for necromancy than the bigger and better known ones. My personal favourites are Ajujo, because he's very clearly associated with necromancy, and Kosatro Kel, because he was a mighty necromancer and is a pretty awesome metal man, and just an all-round cool character. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. I've got more videos on necromancy stuff coming soon.